So I am very delighted to introduce to you now Robert C. Jones, who I had the pleasure of meeting at two previous conferences where we both spoke at Yale University and at a conference put on by the Institute for Critical Animal Studies last year at Binghamton University. Or was it Binghamton University yeah, yeah, or Binghamton, New York? In any case, it was, we, we were there uh, <laughs> together. Uh, so it's just a real pleasure for me to uh, uh, have uh, Robert here as a speaker at our fifth annual Conscious Eating Conference. Robert earned a PhD in philosophy from Stanford University, where his doctoral research focused on the moral significance of non-human animal cognition. Robert is currently an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at California State University. Robert is also a member of the advisory committee of the National Museum of Animals and Society. Robert has published numerous articles and book chapters on animal ethics, animal cognition, food ethics, and research ethics, and he has given numerous talks on animal ethics at universities and conferences across the globe. Robert is going to speak to us about how not to be vegan. <laughs> Please welcome Robert Jones. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And I'd like to say some preliminary thank yous. First of all, thank you to um, Karen and to Hope for having me here. And thanks to Jeannie Trezino for connecting me with Hope to get connected to the conference. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, my mentor who's not here. Her name is Lori Gruen. She is an eco-feminist philosopher and she and I have worked together on uh, these issues and a lot of what I'm going to present today are, came from conversations I've had with Lori as well as a publication that we have together that I'll talk about. Um, and also my friend Gunnar Eggerston in Iceland who helped me work through these ideas. So. Um, the, the ideas for this talk or this paper, this actually what I'm going to present today is actually coming out in a book, um, uh, a chapter in a book. It's coming out this year, I think. I don't know, but it's called New Critical, New Critical Perspectives on Veganism. Um, so look for that in your local bookstore. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure it won't, won't be a, a bestseller. But um, <laughs> anyway, there's a couple of things that, yeah, maybe, you never know. Um, so there are a couple of things that, that pushed me to um, think about this, writing this paper. And, and as I said, Lori Gruen and I have had a lot of conversations about this. So one thing was uh, last year I went to, there's a place in the LA area called Native Foods. It's a vegan restaurant. And it's, uh, it's kind of vegan fast food. And, and so it was a visit there that prompted one aspect of this paper. And then the other aspect is, you know, there's been times where I've been at conferences for, um, like conferences that Karen and I have, have, have shared, where um, I kind of think, well, I'm in this, it's a wonderful place to be because I'm with fellow travelers and everyone here is vegan and we're all doing the same kind of work and we're all interested in the same thing and I feel really comfortable. And then there'll be this weird phenomenon where someone will say something disturbing, like there'll be like a little sexist comment or kind of like a racist comment. And even recently, last year, I was reading a blog by Lauren O'Neillis uh, uh, with Food Empowerment Project, how she went to a vegan, um, a, uh, an, a vegan event. And there was a lot of talk about, there was a lot of racist talk. Right? And she felt really depressed about it and wrote this blog. And so it's weird to me because then I think like, wow, well, I, I wish that person was a fellow traveler, but now I don't feel like they're a fellow tra traveler. They're vegan, and I'm vegan, but I don't share these other beliefs. So it's kind of disturbing. So those are the, those are the two things. It was a trip to native foods, and then this phenomenon of getting disappointed by going, darn it, I, I really liked you, but now I'm feeling bummed out. Right? <laughs> so of course, you know, my talk is how not to be vegan. I, I, I became a vegan in 1987. It wasn't because of Peter Singer. It was because of a book 
called Diet for a New America by John Robbins, which basically it was one of those moments in my life where the scales fell from my eyes and I just, I, it, it was an overnight, you know, overnight conversion. So, um, so, I've been, so that happened a long time ago. And I've been through many stages of veganism, what I call stages of veganism. Um, so today, some people, I talk before about this to vegans, and some vegans get annoyed at me. And I understand that. I just want to sort of establish my vegan cred first and say, <laughs> I'm describing myself when I criticize some vegan practices or vegan attitudes. So I'm not, I'm not holier than thou. I'm actually, it's actually a, a catharsis here today in front of you. Um, so anyway, I want to start with a quote. Uh, I am a philosopher, so I have to have a, a philosopher up there, right? Uh, <laughs> this is a quote from Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, and it says, this is from his, his play, Dirty Hands. How you cling to your purity, young man. All right, stay pure. What good will it do? Purity is an idea for a yogi or a monk. Well, I have dirty hands, right up to the elbows. I've plunged them in filth and blood. So I'm kind of setting the stage for where I'm going with all this. <laughs> um, I believe that those of us living in affluent consumer culture under late capitalism, where plant-based alternatives to meat and dairy are readily available, like Berkeley, are morally obligated to adopt vegan practice. The source of this obligation is grounded in a very widely held belief, namely, that all else being equal, unnecessary suffering and premature death are bad things. And that acting with relatively minimal cost to oneself, we should all aspire to decrease violence, objectification, domination, exploitation, commodification, and oppression wherever and whenever we can. I agree. However, when I say that we are obligated to adopt vegan practice, for me, not just any type of vegan practice will do. So today I want to argue for a specific kind of vegan practice that I call revisionary political veganism. I'm still working on that name. I, I, <laughs> I've changed it like 10 times, but I'll, we'll talk about it. Um, I told you that Lori Gruen and I had worked on an article. This is this, the foundations of with, there's a book out now called The Moral Complexity of Complexities of Eating Meat. So this is a plug for that book if you want to um, if you want to go check into it. It's a really interesting book. Um, all the articles that criticize veganism are wrong and all the ones that are pro-vegan are right. I'm just kidding. It was a joke. Um, <laughs> anyway, I have a whole argument for veganism that I'm not going to go through today, but one of the key premises of my argument is this, and I think most people who are vegan believe this, right? So to argue that the raising and commodification of other than human animals for, for consumption is morally bad is one thing, but to argue that individual consumers ought not purchase animal practice, products is another thing. So there's a bit of a puzzle here. So most people, myself included, right, if you say to most people who are vegan, why are you a vegan, they're going to say, because I, wanna, I, want, I don't want to contribute to suffering. Or I don't want to contribute to that industry. There's some kind of answer. So there's this intuition that we have, right? Like that by me being a vegan, I'm not contributing. So there's, there's, there's this notion that we have intuitively. There's, like, there's like, like a causal connection between my purchasing chicken and chickens dying. And when I withhold my purchase, I feel like I'm doing something positive. I'm decreasing suffering in some way. At least that's how I became vegan, right? When I read Died for a New America. So the assumption behind ethical veganism, and most likely the central reason why a vast majority of vegans go vegan in the first place, is that going vegan decreases animal suffering. So according to this argument, right, by going vegan, you somehow contribute directly to decreasing the harm and suffering on any kind of animal production, whatever the terms. I'm not going to use the F word. Um, so. Uh, there's a, there's a, I, let me go to this slide before I go. So here's when I went to Native Foods. Um, I, I recently ate at the Southern California vegan fast food chain Native Foods where after ordering at the counter I was handed this placard with my number on it. And it says, I, I didn't order this, but it says if you order crispy battered, battered Native chicken wings, you've saved three chickens. That's what it says on the, on the placard, right? Now, of course, unfortunately, I'm a philosopher. So when I read this, 
I have to, I, I, I wonder, and believe me, it's a plague. I wish I did, but I, but I, but I, it's like, what exactly does that mean? <laughs> now, 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 and I want it to be true because when I go up there and I order that crispy battered native chicken, it, I feel really good. I'm, I'm plunking down my cash. I'm thinking, I just saved three chickens, right? But how does that work? How does it work that when I buy that, there are three chickens who are saved. So I started thinking about this, and I started doing a little bit of research into this. How does that work? You know, what's the, what, what does that mean, right? Um, so it can't mean this. It can't mean that there are three chickens who are waiting to be slaughtered, and when I purchase that, they go, okay, stop, don't kill those three, right? It can't mean that. So it doesn't mean that, right? But maybe what the placard means is that, is, is maybe, Three chickens won't be born. So like when I plunk down my money, there's, there's these three eggs, and they're like, well, don't hatch those three because that guy just, so that seems really weird, right? That I would have that kind of effect. Like there's some kind of hatchery where they're just waiting and seeing what you're ordering at the counter, and they're going, they're, 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 they're determining how, it doesn't, that doesn't seem right, right? So I was scratching my head saying, like, what, what does it mean, right? Um, uh, so I think here's what it probably means. Here's what I think it means, being charitable. When consumers as a group, when we as consumers as a group order crispy battered native chicken wings instead of actual chicken wings, the demand for chicken decreases, causing the chicken market to produce less chickens. Translating this market decrease into number of chickens actually saved and dividing by the number of consumers who order the crispy battered native chicken wings, you get the average number of chickens that each individual consumer saves on ordering the crispy battered native chicken wings. In this case, three. Oop, something went. Te technical help, please. I anyway, I can keep talking while they're working on that. Um, but is that really what is intended by the claim on the placard? Uh, and if it is, is, that, is it really that simple? Is it a simple like, calculus where I just do that? So, so I think that the answer is no. I don't think that's exactly how it works. And, and let me, so now I want to raise, um, I, I have, yeah, good. So here's the, here's the, here's the, so there's a whole literature that I didn't know about. There's a whole literature called the vegan impotence objection. And this has nothing to do with sexual performance. <laughs> this has to do with your power as a consumer, as a vegan. There's a whole literature on this. Let me tell you, how, let me tell you the, the criticism that people give on this. Those who criticize vegans argue that this kind of linear causal story that connects individual consumer choice to changing the market gets the facts all wrong. Markets like the chicken market are too massive to be sensitive to the purchasing behaviors of single com consumers. Individual, an individual consumer's choice to refrain from the purchase or consumption of animal products so the claim goes, makes no difference at all in decreasing the number of animals suffering and dying on farms or ranches or whatever euphemism you want to use. Now, you might object and say, this is just some like philosophical, hypothetical, this is not real world. Of course it makes a difference when I buy the crispy battered non-chicken. But I think that's too fast. It's dismissing it too fast. First, it's easy to imagine that someone in the real world reasoning like this. And I have friends who do this all the time. Look, they go to the counter like, whether I order the chicken or not makes no difference whatsoever, so I'm just going to order the chicken. That, that, I can see that happening, right? So it's not this hypothetical case. People reason like this. If I made a difference, it, it would be different if there were a chicken behind the counter and a person with a, with a hatchet, and when you ordered the chicken, then you'd go, I'm not going to order the chicken. But f my friends who are non-vegans, <laughs> my friends, well, they'll just go, well, it doesn't make a difference. There's this feeling of impotence. I don't make any difference as a consumer, right? Second, it, while it's true that collectively consumers of animal products, like meat eaters, cause harm to animals, it's not clear that a particular consumer of animal, pro animal products causes harm. So, so this is true, but it's not clear that this is. So it's true that all of us, as a market force, we have, a, we have a market for us, but it's not clear that just one person going in and ordering chicken, how that works, okay? Um, so, uh, okay, so imagine the following case. I decide to prepare chicken for dinner. 
I head to my local supermarket and purchase a frozen chicken. As philosopher Robert Bass points out, who is a vegan, um, quote, that purchase has no effect on the killing, packaging, freezing, and shipping of that chicken a week or two earlier. The decision weeks earlier to raise a number of chicken, a number of uh, a certain number of broilers from eggs, it has no um, uh, no effect on the decision months or years earlier to operate a chicken house where the chicken spent her life. Nothing I do brings about that one chicken more or less is raised for food. At this point, you might think that my purchasing that one chicken reflects an increase in demand for chicken, and that an increase in demand will lead to a future increase in supply, and thus one more chicken will be slaughtered as a result of my purchasing chicken. But you'd be wrong. You'd be wrong for a number of reasons. First, supermarkets order way more chickens than they expect to sell since waste and spoilage are built into the ordering process. Second, supermarkets in particular and agribusiness more generally are so huge that the chicken market is insensitive to individual consumer decisions. So in, agribusiness markets are just insensitive to me just as a single individual. But if that is so, why is it wrong for individuals to purchase or consume animal products like frozen chicken? Just how responsible are we in causing suffering and harm to other animals when we consume their bodies produced in an industrialized system. What difference do I make as an individual? It seems on the face of it, at least those who challenge this, it seems that individual consumers are powerless as individuals to cause change in such an enormous and immoral market. If that's true though, it seems like individual vegans like me and many of you make virtually no difference whatsoever in decreasing animal suffering. Therefore, the argument goes, Ethical vegans who believe that their individual purchases have causal efficacy on the lives of non-human animals are confused. So this causal impotence objection challenges the reason why myself and other vegans are vegans. It's a challenge saying you're deluded in thinking you're making a difference. Now, so let's go back here. Right, so this is, what, this is what we're presenting with. But there are a number of solutions. Don't worry. We, there's a way out of this. Okay? <laughs> the first solution is a pretty straight ahead solution. And that is, the first solution is just deny that you're impotent as a consumer. And here's the way it works. The first response is simply to deny the causal impotency claim and ask, how can an individual make no difference, but together we make a difference? That doesn't make any sense. Right? If collective action has causal impact, which it does, then at least some individual instances must have causal impact. Collective action is not some spooky occurrence, right? It's like a bunch of us get together and we decide not to buy chicken and that has an impact. Though seemingly imperceptible, there is nonetheless some impact, although it might be very small, that individual consumers have effect. Let me give you an example. It may be that my action as a vegan serves to trigger a threshold. Suppose that the butcher only makes a call to order more chickens when the 100th chicken breast is purchased, or the poultry industry only introduces, uh, only reduces production when a threshold of, say, 10,000 people stop purchasing chicken. It may seem that if you are not the one who purchases the 100th chicken breast, or you're not the 10,000th person who gives up chicken products, you're refraining from some purchases, from purchases, such purchases makes no difference. However, your refraining affects the timing of the slaughter or the cessation of the slaughter. That is an impact even if it is not a direct impact on any individual chicken. So buying or not buying animal bodies does make a difference. Further, and here's the most important part for me, no matter what the causal impact of your refraining from consuming animal products, what is certain is that if you're not a vegan, you're definitely not going to delay. You're not going to contribute to that threshold. So you might go to the counter and, and, and decide not to buy the chicken, and you might say, did I make a difference? Unbeknownst to you, you might be the person on that day who, pushes, who tips the scale to the point where the chicken producers go, oh, we, we need to, they, they need to order less chickens. So being part of an aggregate is a real phenomenon. Now, you might not know if it's going to happen, but it's best to be on the side of good in this case, right, than, than not.
There's a second solution, and that's role modeling. A second response revolves around the notion of role modeling. Many involved in vegan practice influence others. Like, we've all had that experience if you're vegan, which in turn influence others. And this reminds me of a shampoo commercial in its 80s where Heather Locklear, she told one person about her shampoo and so on and so on, and everyone's hair was beautiful back then because of that. <laughs> Thus, veganism can increase the probability that others will become vegan, which increases the probability that the collective action of the aggregate more quickly brings about a reduction in the number of animals produced for food and other consumer goods, decreasing animal suffering and bringing about a decrease in violence, exploitation, and domination. So, there you go. There is, I think, a way around the, the impotence feeling. The feeling as if I'm in this giant consumer um, market and I go to the store, does it make a difference? It makes a little bit of a difference and it may make a bigger difference. And as was pointed out by um, Karen and Hope, um, doing stuff like coming here, being active makes a difference. Influencing makes a difference. So it's not solely as consumers that we act that we make a difference and decrease, hopefully someday eliminate any kind of animal suffering. Okay, so now, I want to move on. Let's see what time it is. Okay. Uh, I want to just go through my notions of veganism. This is the part that people get upset with, but I'll, I'll try not to get you too upset. There's, I, 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 there's different kinds of veganism. I'm going to talk about identity veganism, boycott veganism, and revisionary political veganism. That's the view that I, I, I promote. In adopting vegan practice, a number of ethical vegans see veganism primarily as an individual lifestyle choice, an expression of their commitment to decreasing and ending the suffering and death that accompanies the commodification of sentient non-human beings. Since many ethical vegans may believe that no animals are harmed in the production of their vegan consumer goods and foodstuffs, this ethical vegan lifestyle may sometimes be accompanied by a sense of ethical purity, a belief that once one adopts an eth a vegan lifestyle, the one then has clean hands and may carry on one's consumerism with a clear conscience. Seen as a kind of litmus test of one's commitment to social justice for animals, veganism may sometimes be thought to be the moral baseline for those seeking to end the suffering and domination of other than human animals. Though there are debates among vegans about questions of purity and commitment, there appears to be a growing public perception of vegans what is called in the literature a vegaphobia, that may be based in fact, may be based in prejudice, or more likely a combination, that vegans see themselves as better than and morally superior to non-vegans, that they sometimes appear to be preachy, that they sometimes exhibit a kind of self-righteous zealotry, acting as the vegan police who promulgate veganism as the universal one and only way to fight systemic violence against animals. Such vegans are sometimes perceived as judging non-vegans, including ovo-lacto-vegetarians, as shirking their responsibility or being self-indulgent. This is what I describe, and I'm, I'm describing myself for a long time in my life, this is what I call an identity vegan. Though as consumers, the behavior of identity vegans may in, be indistinguishable from other types of vegans, it is a kind of diluted self-righteousness of some identity vegans that distinguishes them from other kinds of vegans. However, there are two reasons why identity veganism is not the kind of veganism that I endorse. First, identity veganism is at best naive and at worst a way to insulate oneself from a terribly inconvenient truth. For in late capitalist consumer culture, even vegans cannot escape the cycle of state-supported, systemic, industrialized violence and destruction of animals and their habitats. Vegan or not, we all have blood on our hands. Try as they might to believe otherwise, identity vegans must face the fact that regarding our contributions to the objectification of animals and the consumption of animal products, there is no moral sainthood. Second, the central focus of identity vegan practice is the rejection of and abstention from the consumption of non-human animal products, but identity vegans may fail to attend to the lives of other sentient beings who may suffer to produce their consumer goods, specifically human sentient beings. For example, workers in the global south exploited to produce, produce non-animal product containing consumer goods, for example, a cotton shirt at Walmart, may not be considered in the equation relating to personal consumer choice, 
with a reduction or elimination of suffering. To ignore the suffering of Homo sapiens surely is itself a form of speciesism. Further, identity vegans may be blind to the environmental costs of their vegan consumerism. The circumstances driving their clean hand self-image may exclude damage to habitat that the production of vegan foodstuffs often incur. Let me quickly, let me see how much time I have. I think I have 10 minutes, right? So let me, let me quickly go through boycott veganism and then get to where I want to go through. The second kind of veganism is boycott veganism. Boycott veganism, and I've been, I've been, and uh, sometimes I'm an identity vegan. I go all over the place. I'm just, I'm here like as a confession. I, I grew up as a Catholic. This is like a giant <laughs> confessional. I'm trying to confess my sins and, and, and expiate the guilt. So, so boycott vegans accept that a byproduct of the web of production of vegan foodstuffs does involve harming individual sentient beings. However, boycott veganism sees vegan practice as a kind of individual lifestyle choice like identity veganism. But ignoring the larger social, cultural, economic, and political contexts in which systematized institutional violence, suffering, exploitation, domination, and commodification of non-human and human animals are required to produce consumer goods of all kinds. As my friend uh, Vasily Stanescu and, and Stephanie Jenkins write, Boycott veganism conflates conspicuous consum uh, consumption with ethical action and political change. Simply replacing animal with plant-based products only transfers capital to global corporations through different mechanisms. Boycott veganism serves to reinforce capitalist institutions and neoliberal social structures that promote the commodification of life and disguise market forces as neutral, amoral, amoral means of distributing social goods. So some boycott vegans, for example, what the freegans call Taco Bell vegans, I've been one myself, either tacitly or actively condone the continued existence of the very same exploitative neoliberal consumer capitalist structures that produce things like the milk found in milk chocolate that vegans won't eat, but the cacao in the, in the um, dark chocolate produced by child slave labor, that's not that's not okay, but it can be vegan, right? So my point is, the, the, the bigger picture is this, is there's a big structure that exploits humans and non-humans. If you are a vegan solely in the sense that you're voting with your dollars, look, let me just say this. The Koch brothers, they don't care what you buy. They don't care. You can buy cows. You can buy um, vegans. It doesn't matter. They just want you to buy crap. And my argument here is that's a structural problem. Here's an example. There's poisoning of water in Detroit. Here's a solution to that. Just have the people in Detroit go out and buy bottled water. They'll be fine. That's not the solution I want to advocate. Buying bottled water is supporting the same structures that brought the poisoning in Detroit in the first place. My, yeah, thank you. Lastly, and I'll move, I'll move on to my, my view. Lastly, if you're a boycott vegan, let's say you're a boycott vegan and you travel by plane and you drive a Prius and you have 10 kids, you're probably harming the world much more than Michael Pollan who eats an occasional piece of meat. So my point is, boycott <laughs> vegans, a, 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 consu a highly consumer capitalist boycott vegan might be damaging more sentient beings than someone who has no car, who doesn't drive, never flies, uh, stays at home. So my point is, as vegans, we need to open our eyes and we need to see the structures that are causing the oppression and commodification of animals. It's not a simple capital, I put my money down, I save the world. So what's my solution in the four minutes I have left? <laughs> um, Here's my view of veganism. I call it revisionary political veganism. And let me, let me give you uh, quickly what the advantage of, advantages are. One, it's revisionary in that it calls for a, re a rejection of the, conventional, um, uh, of the conventional concept of veganism as an individ individual lifestyle choice. Political veganism reappropriates the term vegan to include a moral and political commitment to active resistance against institutional and systemic violence. 
Political veganism finds solutions to structural violence and oppression in a rejection of the structures themselves. For example, um, I'll skip that. Political veganism, in fact, all veganisms can only be aspirational. The belief that abstaining, abstaining from animal products allows one to avoid um, complicity in harming other animals ignores the complex dynamics involved in the production of consumer goods of all kinds. Living today, even for vegans, involves participating in the deaths of sentient individuals. Vegan diets have welfare footprints or hoof prints in the form of widespread indirect harm to animals. Harms often overlooked or obscured by advocates of other kinds of veganism. Though vegans have, have attended to the tragedy that farmed animals experience, few pay attention to the, far the harms that other animals suffer in the production of vegan foodstuffs. For example, field animals are harmed in the raising of, uh, and harvesting of crops. So if I go to the supermarket and, and I buy a carrot, odds are, if it's an industrial carrot, that some field mouse died. Right? Now, now I could say, well, I'm just going like, to eat air. Right? That's not the option. How many of you, if you have a cat, you know they have this problem. What do you, do you let your cat out? It's going to kill birds. That's, your, that's on your, 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 um, your soul, right? So the point is, we all have dirty hands. None of us is pure. Once we accept that fact, then we can do the best we can to aspire to be the best we can to reduce destruction, commodification, and all these kinds of things that, that, that are brought about by, by consumer capitalism. So we are all... We all aspire to be better. Okay? Now you can't do this. You can go, I'm aspiring to be a vegan. Give me a Big Mac. You, you can't, that's, <laughs> philosophers call that bad faith. That's inauthentic. You have to act in good faith to bring about the world that you want, a vegan world, which I, I'm all in, in favor of. All aspects of consumer capitalism and consumption involve harming others, human and non. So political veganism commits us to striving for a moral goal. It's something that you work at. It's not something that you are. I don't say that I am a vegan. I am working at making the world better, right, and through veganism. So let me, um, let me end with something here. I, I mean, I have, I have more to say in, all, in the question and answer period. This afternoon, I, I'll answer questions. But here's something I find. When I wrote this out, I thought, here's a weird consequence of my view. My view, veganism is, a, is not so much about your behavior. It's about... It's, it's, it's an intentional, it's a thing in your head. And, and, that, and that thing in your head is manifest by your behavior. So let me give you some weird consequences. If taken seriously, political veganism has some interesting, if not counterintuitive, consequences. For example, on the one hand, someone who lives in the global north with disposable income, who eats an exclusively plant-based diet solely reasons for reasons of personal health, is not a vegan to me not a political vegan. Because it's not about your personal health. That's good. It's a nice byproduct. It's really about the billions of suffering sentient beings. That's what being a vegan is about. Right? Conversely, I can imagine, a, this is the part that people get weird about, I can imagine a fellow traveler who earnestly and sincerely aspires with me to be a political vegan, but who lacks the resources, the income, the employment, for example, for example, a freegan or a, a poor, vulnerable single parent who dumpster dives or in some other way takes in animal bodies or their byproducts for sustenance, who would constitute a political vegan in the sense that I'm articulating. Rather than seeing those seemingly odd consequences as a deficiency, I think they act to highlight one of the virtues in that it's very inclusive. So here's the thing, here's the problem I have. I'm a white, middle-class male college professor living in the United States living in California. I can be a vegan pretty easily. I get a paycheck, I go to my local co-op, I buy tofurkey, everything's groovy, my, everything's fine. <laughs> the thing I don't want to do, because there's a certain class racist um, aspect to this, so if there's someone who is a fellow travel, traveler, say a freegan, who can't afford to go to Whole Foods and spend $30 and a half a bag of stuff, but <laughs> that person shares my desire to decrease and remove and eliminate commodification, oppression, uh, 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 violence towards non-human animals, towards, uh, towards vulnerable populations. I want that person in the vegan movement. And if that means that that person's only way of doing that is 
to in some way take animal products in. I'm, I'm, it's not ideal, but I'm saying I, don't, I want to figure out a way to include people like that in, in the movement and not make it a solely upper class white people's movement. I will. Anyway, in conclusion, I, I, I have argued that those of us living in affluent consumer culture under late capitalism uh, are, are obligated to vegan practice. And um, I, I ultimately argue that vegans are obliged to actively engage with and resist those power structures that are built on speciesism, violence, oppression, exploitation, domination, objectification, and commodification of all sentient beings, human and non-human, and their habitats and environment. I see political veganism not merely as a theoretical construct, but as a call to action and engagement by those of us in the global north to retreat from our destructive consumer capitalist ontologies and use our privilege to reduce and ultimately eliminate suffering while forging moral and just relations of care, compassion, and respect. Thank you.